All right, guys, welcome to the Drew Strong Podcast, episode number 22, where I talk with Coach John Garrish. John is a strength and conditioning coach for the local high school out here. It's a North Broad Prep. But the great thing about John is he is a specialist when it comes down to bringing up the athlete from the lower levels. We're talking about from seven, eight years old, all the way up to the college level. So again, developmental Uh, strength conditioning is what we're going to be talking about today. Also talking a lot about speed and about agility and how you can utilize sprinting mechanics to increase overall performance for every athlete. Now, before we get into that, got to thank the sponsors. First one is going to be Revive, Revive MD. Check out revivesubs.com. You can go on there and check out my very own athlete stack where I have a plethora, you like that word, plethora of great supplements that you can utilize to help with performance and recovery. So if you go on there, revivesubs.com, look at Phil DeRue's athlete stack and make sure you use the discount code DeRueStrong20 to get 20% off of your final purchase. Also, make sure if you haven't done so, if you're a part of my mentorship program, what's up guys? If not, make sure you check it out. I got well over 10 to 12 years of information on there that I've gathered over this time of being a strength and conditioning coach, all for you guys inside the portal. If you check it out, it's my online mentorship course and coaching certification. Go ahead and check it out. Link in the description is there. Um, again, if you don't know where to go, if you can't click the link in the description, go to my website, drewstrong.com. You'll find out more information. Now let's get on to the podcast. Boom. somewhere else to keep going that little voice in your head is trying to stop you from getting to where you want to be be successful and keep moving forward with your host and world-renowned strength and conditioning coach Phil Delru. all right John Garrish here you guys know John Garrish if you don't John's going to go ahead and go over his background and what he does strength and conditioning coach and one of the guys that I truly respect in the industry so John Thanks for coming Appreciate to the gym and blessing us with our with your presence. It. It's great to be here. Um, name's John Garrish. I've I've been at North Broward Prep in Coconut Creek here, mm-hmm. um, just down the street. Um, for I'm going on my seventh year, which is crazy to Damn. think. I feel yeah. like we connected the first time, maybe like yeah. third year in, second year in. And I yeah, yeah, like yeah. We're both kind of puppies, but mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's crazy to see how we've developed over time. Um, like I said, I'm going into my seventh year. Um, got my start through my college career. I was playing football. Um, had one too many uh, concussions and picked up picked up track and field. Um, Just there it is. There's yeah, there's a yeah, exactly. connection right there. Look at that. Um, picked up track and field and um, hammer throw in particular. Nice. And that took me to a few different spots. Ended up uh, finishing my graduate um, years at the University of North Texas. Nice. Had a year to compete. Um, that last year of my master's, I got into strength and conditioning, cool. working with Frank Winter and staff, mm-hmm. um, Chris Soroka and staff at North Texas. And nice. Shortly after Rutgers University, and not long after that, I was I was down here um, uh-huh. back home. This is home for me. So yeah, so you grew up down here, huh? Yeah. Uh-huh. Where'd you Where'd you go to school? I went to Boca High. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so at so you went to Rutgers, right? What were you doing at Rutgers? Uh, I was basically a graduate intern. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. More or less. So you worked with the football team primarily. Yeah, that was football only. Okay, so would you say primarily right now that's kind of your your staple? That's what you would call like maybe your expertise in a way. Football? Yeah. Um, that's my that is my um, most simple connection point I mm-hmm. think to kids. The gotcha. kids when I meet a, a young man um, that is a high school football player, mm-hmm. I I immediately probably have a connection with them. I feel yeah. like it's much easier for me to relate to that kid mm-hmm. than that it's tough to relate to a kid from another sport. Sure. Um, it, it, high school football players, especially growing up down here, immediate connection point because that's how I grew up. True, you know? true, so true, it's true. very easy to, to have that. Um, and then, you know, what has kind of become my, my love and my passion specific, you know, I already mentioned kind of high school age or, mm-hmm. or youth, but um, in, from a training standpoint, especially um, speed development, and yeah. I would say even more um, particularly 
uh, more more specifically linear speed. Mm -hmm. I'm also the school's head track and field coach. So gotcha. um, I think also just being a South Florida kid, mm -hmm. you know, and that speed runs everything down here. True. Um, and obviously, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to be the first one to jump yeah. up and down about the importance of the weight room. Mm -hmm. um, but again, in connecting with kids down here, I think speed is that is that easy point of, of reference yeah. and emphasis that that we can have that connection. It's kind of like the X factor in a way, you know. Like I feel like you know, a guy can, if a kid has speed, you can really develop them as an athlete, you know, or yeah. just just in general, like have that ability to have, be that quick twitch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with the kids that you work with, you work with like from like what age? Seven, eight, nine? Yeah, seven? I mean, I'll even see some kids younger than that. Wow. Just kind of hanging out and coming with my group or something yeah. like that. I'm about to bring my son over, yeah, man. Come on, I'm yeah. serious, for real. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say, you know, consistent um, attendees, I would say seven or eight. I've got wow. a couple seven or eight year olds. Gotcha. Um, on to, I mean, I, I, I'll train some some adults that might be in the same group, and you know, especially for hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So long, they're in the same group, or they? Yeah. Wow, that's so, crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, and and a thing that I've I've um, picked up in the community over the last couple of years is our our speed school, our free training sessions. Gotcha. And I invite anybody, nice. and um, I think to me, it's on me as the coach and the designer of, of the program. Yeah. Um, to meet the needs of everybody, and now okay. for the seven or eight year old, mm -hmm. maybe they're doing some drills that they're getting more coordination and early skill development out mm -hmm. of it than mm -hmm. in advanced maybe track athlete it gotcha. is working on some more minute details in the same drill you know yeah, maybe yeah, a yeah. seven or eight year old is just doing something that they don't know why they're doing it <laughs> yeah. having fun, they're having fun. Mm -hmm. and seeing some older guys and gals around yeah. and feeling cool about themselves i yeah, think that's, that's cool. an important piece mm -hmm. um and also it's just if if you've got a positive attitude and you want to come and train and yeah. i don't have to worry about um bringing you along from an effort or you know mm -hmm. intention standpoint yeah you're good to go. welcome let's talk about that a little bit because that's that's interesting because i've seen john from afar and now that we've known each other we're literally like i want to say maybe 10 or 20 minutes away from each other um working with the kids that he's worked with or you worked with I've seen like a tremendous increase in their body positioning, their control, you know, it, with kids. I was talking with, with John off camera and you, you know, like when kids start, man, they're like wet noodles, right? They, they really can't move. They have no stability there. What is like the first start when you get a young kid, let's say eight years old, what are you doing with them? Like, how are you progressing them? Yeah. So now, and, and usually an eight year old, um, it all depends on the setting, of course. Mm -hmm. but, so if you told me an ideal setting that maybe I'm gonna see a seven or eight year old for a regular amount mm -hmm. of time, if you told me I was gonna see a seven, eight year old for 10 or 20 years to be yeah. able to train them for that long, it would be spectacular. But that's that's rarely the case. Yeah. Um, general coordination is gonna be a, a big piece. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and really I would say um, in, my, in my time at North Texas, um, really, of all my time, I tell any young coach that the thing that I feel I got the most out of from an educational standpoint mm -hmm. um, was what I learned from a, a tremendous class in grad school about um, motor skill acquisition, mm -hmm. motor development, um, and, and just motor learning. So mm -hmm. um, in, in the way that I program, almost... I almost think more along the lines of that okay. than of X's and O's. And now that's not to say that we don't have a board like this, that mm -hmm. we're designing programs. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's okay, so what is the, um, whether it be a gross motor skill or something a little more fine, mm -hmm. what is it that we want to develop and yeah. how do we get that? How do we get there? So we work backward from that, that point. Gotcha. So, the earlier, now you might have a seven or eight year old, honestly, mm -hmm. seven or eight year olds should be the best at some of those skills that like, it's almost easier to catch those seven or eight year olds than it is a 17 or 18 year old. Because okay. when I have a seven or eight year old and I tell them to skip or gallop, they don't look at me like I'm crazy when I look at, when I tell a 17 year old yeah. that's got a Georgia offer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask them to gallop. They look at me like I'm crazy, <laughs> but it's an important, um, to me, it's an important skill um, that is not just it's not just because we want to feel like we have more coordination. It's not yeah. necessarily only that. There's higher levels that we can advance some of those movements, those mm -hmm. general coordination um, mm -hmm. movements um, that can be taken to a higher level. Mm -hmm. So um, really thinking in terms of that, so any skill that we want to progress towards, mm -hmm. it's not too early for a seven or eight year old to be thinking towards what we want them to be doing in the weight room either. Gotcha. So just, and now that doesn't mean to, 
taking a PVC and taking them through mm. a squat progression that I might yeah. take a 14 or 50, 15 year old. Mm -hmm. um, but you can kind of sprinkle in some squat patterning through some, yeah. you know, hurdle step unders that are, mm -hmm. you know, um, disguised as an obstacle course and things gotcha, like that. Gotcha. Just ways for kids to enjoy their time mm -hmm. um, and develop some of those yeah. Really general skills. So you're still you're still working the adaptations necessary, but you're making it fun. You're making it interesting for the kid. Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think I think with the kids, I think you know, obviously they're, they're more apt to learning and, and developing as opposed to you already trying to reevaluate or retangle a bad motor pattern yeah. with the older kids. Yeah. And you see that with those 16, 17, 18 Absolutely. year old kids. And then so if you get a high school kid, right, and he's just coming to you and, and you're trying to develop and getting them ready for the next level, right? Um, what are the major things that you are assessing them when you come when they come into you know the gym? Yeah, so hopefully that kid. I mean, it might be different if it's a student mm -hmm. that is going to come in and train as a member of one of our school's teams and gotcha. sports versus a you know 15 year old whose parents called me and said they want to do some form of one on one training. Obviously. Gotcha. When we got one on one, you can talk to that more than I can. I mm -hmm. mean, we have the opportunity to get a little more specific. Gotcha. In my general, all encompassing programming, we want that young man or young woman to come up to speed at a pace of their own, but also mm -hmm. be ready to train with the group. So, gotcha. Um, it, it really does all depend on what the kind of just the, the needs analysis, what the what the expectation is from the parents, sure. from the kid, what they want to get out of it. If it's if it's just a once a week mm -hmm. or a couple times a month, like speed mm -hmm. session, that's a completely different conversation, too. Yeah. So, it, you know, is it is it something is the, is the kid a, a track kid or really any sport? And their parent asked me, I, mm -hmm. I want to help my kid get faster. Mm -hmm. Is it a kid that, you know, and it could also be based on what their not just their genetic makeup, but, yeah. you know, some other kind of um, some other kind of measures such as you know body type um, are mm. they are they more of a twitchy kid are they mm. more of a muscly type kid mm. um, and seeing how we can like we never want to to me i think something that i failed to do early on was mm. i i identified kids and said that's their strength we don't necessarily need to work on their strength let's gotcha. work on their weaknesses um, that's interesting we always want to pick up their weaknesses but yeah if you look at the best of the best, mm -hmm. there's a reason why they're so great, and yeah. usually it's because of that strength that they have. Yeah, of course you always have the you know some guys and gals that are just so well developed in, mm -hmm. a, in a variety of areas. But yeah, more often than not, that that top top athlete in any given sport has mm -hmm. that that something to them mm -hmm. that makes mm -hmm. them special. So For sure, yeah. finding that you know finding if a kid that you know if a kid's just. Uh, a, a mover in such a way again if the kid's more of a you know fascially or, or tendon driven athlete mm -hmm. um you know we want to we want to bring those strengths out of them versus yeah. just training you know running our head against the wall gotcha. um, trying to only focus on the weaknesses yeah that's that's interesting because i do feel like a lot of people are like all right yeah we know he's he's strong let's let's just get him faster or, or you know but again there is focus points at given times and 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 it really depends on where they're at in their career in their season whatever the case when now you work with all sports correct yes so let's say for instance I'll go back to the football teams more so than anything so if you're at the football season let's say off season get right getting right into the season like we're right there maybe like a month or two after what are you usually focusing on with those kids to get them ready for the season yeah so uh, I mean that would be general year annual programming mm -hmm. um, they come off of so I'll work from season going out so they'll have their season we'll do some in-season training stuff mm -hmm. I don't want to go too into detail with that because it's nothing it's nothing sexy it's you know we want to make sure that especially young kids are training they're mm -hmm. under a bar gotcha. and if we can keep that going through season we're not maintaining because they're mm -hmm. to be honest with you and you could you could agree or disagree with me I'm not sure but a, mm -hmm. a 16 year old young boy mm -hmm. ought to be getting stronger at any four month period of that year so sure. if if they're under a bar yeah. from september who knows what's going to happen this year but on a normal year from august september till november or so 
if they're if they're still under a bar, they're going to be getting stronger. You know, it's yeah. not, it's not okay. going to be a maintained type of, of concept. So, yeah. um, coming off season, then that's when the track piece kind of takes over. So, mm-hmm. uh, me being the head track and field coach, mm-hmm. that now gives those kids the opportunity that our football kids are not going to miss any lifts in the spring. That's going to be an important piece of their track training. Gotcha. Um, and also, we know that they're going to get their speed development. So, mm-hmm. in that time of year, from a talking purely from just a speed agility quickness standpoint yeah we know that because it's track season i know that it's mm-hmm. going to be their training is going to be largely linear um, okay. not from a standpoint of programming but i'm saying literally from a sprinting standpoint okay. because we're going to be on the track so yeah so so these guys are the guys that are doing track in yeah, so football if you're if you're a football player on mm-hmm. our campus if you're a soccer player on our campus if you're a basketball player on our campus it, it is it it's is required. those school, those programs coaches um uh, I don't want to say pressure, but it's their um, expectation that you are training in the off season, and their training in the springtime mm-hmm. is track and field, which I think is is as a high school strength and conditioning coach. Yeah, I don't know how I did it any other way. Obviously, uh-huh. you can do it, but. Uh, yeah. I think it is. It has been so beneficial to our track program just because we have our athletes out there. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're you're picking like the best out of every sport. <laughs> correct. Yeah. I mean, and and you never know for the kids mm. too. You never know. Yeah. You know, I didn't know what a hammer throw was when I was I bet, 16, bro. and yeah. it took a concussion in college to pick it up, and I found <laughs> that that was my love all along. Yeah. <laughs> but so we know that we're going to be predominantly linear from the months of I'll say January to uh, March, early April. Cool. I, I think our district meet is usually the first week of April yeah if we've got guys that are advancing to the regional or state meet we'll we'll still be in that training um, kind of idea okay um, but spring ball is usually shortly thereafter mm-hmm. um, so when is that March April, no April? it's it's uh, I want to say it's usually late April I want to say we expected to start spring ball like April 26 or something usually like forgive yeah. me for being off on those dates am I am if I am but usually it's late April and it gotcha. goes into May so cool. I usually like to get a like three or four week block that we can get some form of multi-directional mm-hmm. movement just so they're prepared for spring ball mm-hmm. you know those the, mm-hmm. the tissue is used to the stimulus of, mm-hmm. of, of just training in a different um, capacity so mm-hmm. um, then when we come off of spring ball that's when we're in the summer and that's really the time that we're talking about so yeah. one two months away whatever it may be usually we get you know a, a good eight week training block seven eight weeks okay. of, of the summer okay. um, my, my programming methodology from a weight room standpoint is definitely in inspired and motivated by the tier system Mm -hmm. Um, there's definitely been some deviations off of it just Mm -hmm. in terms of my thinking of um, motor skill acquisition and and motor learning yeah Um, and also a an introduction to the Olympic lifts so um, when I was with Frank at with Frank Wintrick at North Texas Mm -hmm. um, there was minimal really no Olympic lifts in the tier system and yeah. that, that wasn't necessarily how um, Joe Ken Kenna designed it so mm-hmm. it's not necessarily a tier system thing mm-hmm. it's just the system that I came from and the system that I learned out under um, we weren't doing much from an Olympic lifting standpoint okay. um, was that more so because he just didn't know how to coach it is that like no more, more I so think that? he knew how to coach it really, really? Well. okay yeah, I knew I think he knew he just didn't agree it. with yeah yeah putting uh-huh. him through it yeah okay. and I, I, I think you know that also um, kind of led me to thinking along the lines of some sprint jump throw mm-hmm. concepts and things like that that mm-hmm. Uh, still from a power development standpoint, still from a um, just overall training standpoint, mm-hmm. I thought would provide a great benefit for that. Like if you're familiar with the tier system, mm-hmm. you have total body movements, yep. lower body movements, upper body movements. Mm-hmm. Largely our total body movements were sprinting, jumping, throwing. And gotcha. that's, that's kind of how we thought of that power development. You know what? Before we go on, let's go yeah. ahead and go over that a yeah. little bit more. So people that don't know... Uh, like I said, we had uh, we had John Heck on here talking about the same thing, mm-hmm. but John didn't really go into detail. Can you basically break down the tier system for us? Sure. For yeah. So um, from a from a programming standpoint, X's and O's on paper, uh, you you're looking at the body in segments. So uh-huh. upper body, lower body, and then you have total body movements as well that are going to include all of the above. Like I said, mm-hmm. if if you look at the at the textbook, you're going to see that most of those total body movements, mm-hmm. like triple extension yeah. oriented movements are Olympic lifts. That's that's gotcha. largely how uh, the initial um, tier system at least in in how you would read it, it was designed. Yeah. So um, basically, then it goes in rotations of that. So you have total body, lower body, upper body. So mm-hmm. your Monday 
just in a in a general format would be you start with the total body movement. Mm -hmm. That's your highest intention or you know your your intention of the day. That mm -hmm. movement is could be power, could be strength, with. could be whatever. Yeah. So okay. so generally speaking, yeah. I mean, it just depends on probably how you're progressing and programming it. Okay. Um, but that total body movement would be first, then your lower mm -hmm. body movement, and then your upper body movement. So okay. it's under the premise of typically three days a week mm -hmm. total body training rotation of movements of, of total body, lower body, upper body. So Monday mm -hmm. total, lower than upper, and then you could of course finish with some ancillary and accessory work. Okay. Um, and then and now, it, with the accessory work, I don't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. With the accessory work, what are you focusing on with the accessory work? Is that from the total body? Is that from? Generally, yeah, I would probably, you know, and again, so that's where, and I'll, I'll get into kind of how I started to design okay. our system around that and mm -hmm. how it still has certainly influenced us, especially so that the other thing about, especially working with Frank at North Texas and seeing what the tier system had to offer is the developmental phases and stages that athletes can go through and gotcha. the easy implementation of different movements or not different movements, but progressions and regressions of movements yeah. that are meet the needs of all of our athletes. So, okay. Um, so, and then Wednesday, then it rotates. So your lower body movement was second on Monday. Now that's your first, that's your primary emphasis. Gotcha. And then you would go upper body next, and then you would finish with the okay. total body. Okay. And then Friday you would go upper body first, mm -hmm. total body next, lower body. Now it's always going to be power first strength and then hypertrophy so uh, yeah and okay. it, it doesn't again it doesn't necessarily have to be designed that way the mm -hmm. way that um because still you're talking about then okay so if that's your thought process you're talking about wednesday finishing with the total body movement at mm -hmm. least in your in your primary tiers in yeah. your third tier so now, if you did follow suit with that, mm -hmm. probably you're not doing Olympic lifts for hypertrophy. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, but also for me, um, in the way that I wanted to design our programming, um, along uh, and along the lines of still knowing that we're getting a, uh, I don't want to say a high volume, but we're sprinting on the track. Yeah, we're doing a, an adequate enough or an adequate amount to me of medicine ball throws, uh -huh. of, of jumps, single jumps, multiple jumps, gotcha. bios. Explosive strength. Um, so I know that we're still getting a large, uh, you know, at least a dense amount of that, that, that power and that, okay. that explosive work. Um, but, and I mean, our weight room could be full of 60 to 65 I kids I know, that's from, crazy. from middle school to high school and usually generally if we're talking in teams yeah. you know, we could have there were there was a point where we had a senior that was bound for Notre Dame yeah. um, and a freshman that you know it's like yeah. are you sure you want to do this um, <laughs> that's so crazy so, the, the level of difference so yeah that. just looking at that and looking at space and and designing around the idea that we weren't necessarily at least in their in their totality mm -hmm. um, going to utilize the Olympic lifts um, but still wanting to teach our kids and give them a, a introduction dose of, of how to move around a bar gotcha. and how to move a bar so that when that kid does go to play a college sport, in this instance, we're talking about football. So when the kid does go to play college football, mm -hmm. um, they're they're prepared to to get under a bar and yeah, do what they need to do. You know, um, they're prepared for just about anything. So yeah, I think with that, I think you do a really good job with that when it comes down to preparing kids for the next level. Because I talk to a lot of college coaches, I consult for some college teams. And the biggest thing that they say to me is that they're looking for kids that know how to move properly. Because yeah. like, they can te they're going to get them stronger. Sure. They're going to get them conditioned, you know, and some of them, and they like speed, mm -hmm. going back to that, yeah. right? So they love speed because they can so build on top of that, right? Yeah. So what I'm seeing from John, guys, is that he takes things very that could be very detailed and intricate, but makes them very simple, if that makes sense, yeah, right? It. Keeping it very simple, but also very highly effective, especially with young kids all the way up into the high school levels. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about organization, because you do have, you just said you have 60 plus kids, mm -hmm. and they're all different age ranges, right? Different styles of, you know, or I, I guess you should say, different points in their life. Mm -hmm. How do you go about organizing the plan of action each day for, for your training sessions? Sure. So, I mean, just like I said, there's, we know what, from, from kind of how I like to 
put things into uh, perspective with the tier system. That's mm -hmm. like the, the simplest way I can look on paper and design. These are going to be our movements of emphasis for the day. Mm -hmm. And then those movements of emphasis in particular, we're talking a little more general in nature than we are um, not even thinking, okay, back squat is our movement of the day. Okay. It's, it's a squat pattern, you know? Yep. So, yep. I mean, just like most programs would progress and regress based on yes. movements, but we've got our, you know, and, and granted, I'm, I'm giving an extreme example when I say 65, and it could be middle school, it could be high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm lucky to have now three middle school classes that I can design something specific for them that mm -hmm. meets their needs. And then for the most part, I see our high school students before after school or gotcha. you know, in some other training capacity. So Still upwards to a large amount of kids, though. Absolutely. For and sure. still from the reason why I like coaching this level so much is is the changes that you see from 14 to 18 i'm sure absolutely absurd and we can I'm just sure. we were talking off air like we can most of these kids we can pretty much just get out of their way yeah, yeah, yeah. they're gonna be okay yeah um but being able to see those changes mm -hmm. not just in the individual but also that a 17 18 year old is going to be so different in so many ways from a 14, yeah. 15 year old um so still it's okay um, if, if our primary movement of the day is going to be a, a squat pattern and mm -hmm. back squat is for our higher level athletes, gotcha. um, maybe okay. a goblet or landmine for the other. Okay. And that also helps me organize and set up the room too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if we've got back squat going, okay, I know that we can have another setup going with landmine. Mm -hmm. I know that we can go another setup with goblet squat. Yeah. Now we've got six racks, um, six landmine stations numbers of, of dumbbells so now versus thinking we only have six racks now we've got at least 18 workstations that yeah. you, know, you got you got a pretty good gym there oh it's awesome yeah, yeah i mean but i see that like with my space now and we're limited I've, i i kind of adopted that same aspect of how we do things is that like okay listen we're gonna do a squat pattern we're gonna do a hinge pattern we're gonna do a push pattern pull pattern whatever and then it's auto-regulated based Absolutely. on the individual. So that's that's awesome. So now let's get into because when you do those landmine like exercises, I, you're very like I guess you could say the way you go about picking them. Like I'm like man, how does he come up with these things, man? Because I'm, I'm pretty. I, I would like to say that I have that that ability to do certain things to develop exercises that are going to be very efficient. Um, when you come up with these landmine exercises, are you thinking about you know the athlete in general? Or are you thinking about biomechanics or all the above? Sure. So I mean, it, that can go any which way. I mean, we've used landmine movements for um, expression and even development of power. Mm -hmm. um, we've used landmine movements for hip mobility. We've used mm -hmm. landmine movements for, I hesitate to say shoulder mobility, but uh -huh. certainly at least um, shoulder girdle stability and, mm -hmm. and movement around that stability yeah. um, without getting too into detail. But I, mm -hmm. I think there, I think it's wide ranging. And just like I said, in thinking of our weight room in our space and understanding who our you know population is, yeah. same thing goes with just how I started with the, with speed training. It's mm -hmm. okay, instead of saying like, I want to, you know, either limit the groups to only these 12 guys or gals gotcha. and you have to be at this level and then the other group is training at this time. Instead it's okay, what what tools are at my fingertips in the weight room mm -hmm. that we would be able to use that we can still space the room out and yep. still um, split the group up in ways that they can continue training and not mm -hmm. everyone standing around waiting for something. Um, but also you can break movements down a little bit and regress them based on that. So you've got progressions and regressions of squat and hinge patterns that we can do. Mm -hmm. Again, like I had, had kind of um, gotten started on, introducing the athletes to the timing and coordination of some triple extension, quote unquote, type movements, uh, mm -hmm. similar to what would be in, in the Olympic lifts. Yeah. Um, and so, and then also the ability of the landmine to really move in multiple different planes yeah now you can do rotational type movements and things yeah. like that that are um that have been have proven really beneficial to us so mm -hmm. um you know and then another way that kind of i guess that like none of it is creativity mm -hmm. it's more so just again we might work like a landmine snatch movement that it's all right well we don't feel super comfortable with our space and number of kids 
performing a, a full Olympic snatch. Yeah. Um, but we can teach, again, generally speaking, how to move the bar, how to move around the bar yeah. um, it, through those movements mm -hmm. and um, kind of progressing through that way. And then mm -hmm. another way that kind of some of those different movements came into the fold is like some of our kids doing things wrong, quote unquote, and we see that a lot. Like there's different, I'm sure. there's different movements that yeah. it looks like maybe somehow I or some other coach has come up with, and yeah. really it was just because <laughs> we had an intention, and yeah. the kid did something awkward, and yeah, it just worked. And it's like, wait a second, how did yeah. you do that? What did you just? Uh, do? And, yeah, he's, um, he's, they're innovating. Yeah, <laughs> you, said, you know, I start playing around with it. And I'm like, know. You know That's the thing. Like when I watch your stuff, I always think like this guy does crazy stuff with his landmine. I mean, yeah. yeah, and you know, it's again, it's it, it's it's ideas, it's um, you know, um, wide ranging um, thoughts and opportunities again uh, mm -hmm. to, to make sure we're training and active. Yeah. Um, yep. But that doesn't mean that, you know, just because I'm demonstrating something doesn't mean that we're using everything on a daily basis. No, if, yeah, you're not the landmine guy. I'm yeah. not saying, <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong, guys. But, but what I am, like, just, just from an innovation standpoint, that's, I see how effective it can be, you know. And, and you're looking at it from who you're working with, the, the space that you have, the amount of athletes and kids that you have. I think it's very efficient. You know, I think that that's something that people need to adopt. And man, somebody from the landmine company or something, they need to give me some money for this because I'm I'm really bigging up these landmines. Oh, yeah. So, but yeah, man. So, so again, I want to talk a little bit about speed because that's something that I I'm not gonna lie, it's not my strong suit, right? I mean, I feel like I'm fast. I grew up in South Florida. I ain't, I ain't too fast. The Devin, see, see my, my, my brother over here is laughing behind me because, man, I ran, I ran okay, right? And what I would say is that I attributed that to more forced production into the sure. ground. Do you feel like that has a major role in, in gaining speed? Absolutely, 100%. Mm -hmm. Again, just as I had kind of alluded to in when a kid first walks into the door, you're mm -hmm. gonna have, I, I, I've used this example and it's a really good anecdote to me in coaching kids in understanding that and I'm also like in in from a sprint standpoint like I love the biomechanics of it mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna say that I get so into detail that it's yeah. like expert level but it mm -hmm. just it infatuates me because that to me sprinting to me and I know it's easy to say that as a track coach mm -hmm. but it's the ultimate movement assessment yeah. because you see, True. I mean, you see either a kid's degree and um, intent of rotation. You see mm -hmm. a kid's degree or intent lack thereof. Mm -hmm. um, you see, I, I and and this anecdote anecdote that I was saying was, I would say, really, my four fastest male sprinters that I ever had the opportunity to coach, at least mm -hmm. on campus, full time, mm -hmm. seeing them on a daily basis. Um, and, and by no means, and this is my point in saying that I'm not taking credit in any way for their um, progression and development. We had um, the young man that I mentioned that's at Notre Dame now, he's mm -hmm. a six foot three, 200 pound, rocked up receiver type yeah. receiver there. Gotcha. Um, we had so he graduated a few years ago that was one of my that still to this day is is my best male sprinter mm -hmm. um a young man today who will probably surpass his times he's a rising i guess he's a rising junior now this school right. year we missed out on this like these kids are growing so i know old. man rising junior now but he's probably about the same height but he's maybe like 170 pounds oh, and wow. he's a soccer player oh, high man. level soccer player great kid mm -hmm. but um, moves entirely different mm. um, from how the other young man moves. Another gotcha. is a uh, five foot six, hundred and ninety oh, wow. pound wow. running back type that's just rocked Solid. up. Solid. Um, and then one who um, is five foot five or six and probably a hundred and sixty pounds, gotcha. much leaner, and just yeah. is just like a twitch of, mm. of lightning. Um, so those four young men were and still do things really well on the track and in many ways probably in some of like timing assessments might run the exact same time so really? you find the right distance and probably all four of those guys could run close to the same time That's but if crazy. you watch how they move mm -hmm. it is just so to me it is always so impressive in how how different 
mm-hmm. um, their their signatures of movement are. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, what can you always go back to? And it's mm-hmm. applying force into the ground. Gotcha. So, um, but the and and one thing that I took really, especially from the first young man that I mentioned, was. I spent way too much time trying to coach him out of of rotation, Mm -hmm. and I thought of it as wasted motion, Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a big failure on my part Mm -hmm. um, from a coaching standpoint because I realize now that many many athletes that rotate, oscillate, Mm -hmm. almost sway, Mm -hmm. um, do that for a reason, and there's a reason that's part of the reason why they're um, so great at what they do. Gotcha. Biomechanics are a big part of, of what I like to look at sprinting wise. Yeah. Yet it always comes back to, to force application mm-hmm. ultimately. Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of, you know, from a from a standpoint of individual athlete, okay, if they have the if they have the capability, if they have the force capability and the ability to apply apply great forces into the ground at mm-hmm. a very fast rate. All right, now is there anything that's kind of holding them back from doing that? Okay. And then it's it's kind of the, the chicken or the egg. Yeah. Because yes, the application of force into the ground is going to have a quote unquote rebound effect and mm-hmm. it's gonna set them up probably in good postures and positions. Yeah. Um, but I think if you teach some postures and positions, mm-hmm. just in the way, again, motor skill acquisition yeah. and, and uh, motor learning, slow to fast, simple to complex, um, I think you can kind of just ingrain some of those things in their head. I, mm-hmm. I like the kids to, in everything, um, feel it not hear it and especially yeah. i think i said um on accident i want them to feel what i'm trying to say <laughs> or or they were probably looking at you like, huh? or feel what i want them to hear and i can't say that to a kid there's yeah a yeah yeah things, there's a lot of things that i see especially in sprinting mm-hmm. we have the tendency to overcoach sprinting 100 uh, i'm sure 100 yeah. percent. Sure. now i think the coaching to me comes into a from a biomechanical perspective mm-hmm. um video assessment imaging Mm -hmm. um looking at what a kid's doing Mm -hmm. taking a lot of time on my part to think okay is this something that the kid is intentionally doing and makes them great or is it something that might be hindering their um capabilities and and potential for what they can do um and then it takes a lot of time on our end and then it's okay well what what is the cue and usually the cue is not a verbal one but it's an it's an active or or uh, uh, uh like a tactile tactile one um, exactly was the word I was looking for um, versus again you could say you know, I don't know. whatever it doesn't Anything. matter I don't want to throw out any bad yeah. cues but you could say one thing that's going to really a kid's going to relate to it one way and another that's going to be completely completely different so yeah I mean kids learn every kid learns differently I, but I do feel even with me with combat sports it's like if I can get a guy and, and kind of palpate or put something mm-hmm. there for them they can understand how to move efficiently and and produce that torque that they need for producing power for their punches and their strikes. When you're looking at an athlete, let's say for instance you're they're running linear, are you watching like I know I know you're watching like movement, biomechanics, hip hip rotation. What are the major things are you looking at? Are you starting from the feet to the hip? Like how yeah. does that work? The feet do um they do present a, a lot bears its head in what the foot is doing. Mm-hmm. And then you could then, interestingly enough, look at what the hand is doing and usually it's the opposite hand and that's something that wow. I've been um, really um, active in thinking about and pursuing as a coach is what, how can we vary the hand position um, to alter potentially what the foot is doing. Okay. So, um, meaning nothing crazy, but mm-hmm. you see kids run with different hand positions, open fist, closed fist. Yeah. Um, something as simple as putting something in a kid's hand and telling them to hold it in a certain way. It's uh-huh. interesting how you see the foot react and relate differently to the ground. Now, hmm. that doesn't mean necessarily to me, I wouldn't be, I, I would not be the person that says like the foot is, yeah. The amount of nerve endings and the necessity of it okay. to move in a an incredible way. I could say starts and ends at the foot, mm. but I think it also um, presents what's happening at the hip, which is extremely necessary to see. Um, again, I think so. One of the things that really changed my mindset, um, like I had said when I was coaching that young man, to stop rotating and uh-huh. <laughs> telling him to run straight. <laughs> Terrible idea. Um, 
I, I watched at the um, Florida High School State Championship in 2018, and I'm not going to mention any of the young men's name, even though it would be all great things. Sure. They're all incredible athletes, incredible, seem like incredible people. Mm -hmm. um, the eight finalists in the 2A competition all happen to be future Division One college football players. Yeah. Two of them are still competing in Division One track and field, and really could be the opportunities would be en endless for them and will be endless for them on the track end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So what I saw was I watched that from the finish line and I saw that, I don't want to say every last one of them because uh -huh. it's not always going to be to the degree that all of them do, but from where I was standing, just about all of them, you saw in almost what looked like exaggerated internal rotation of their hit, mm. especially through acceleration. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But even as present when they were at upright speeds, yeah. um, that that was like a big switch for me. So okay. when I when I then wanted to look at, and now it, it's then spun into so many different directions that that's not always the number one thing to look for because okay. a kid might not be um, driven in the same way and a kid might accelerate really well because they're a little bit better um, and stronger in external rotation and then they okay. tend to, and I don't want to get too into detail there, but that, that's a big thing that I look at. I certainly like to look at what the foot and knee is doing because I usually can paint a picture of what the hip's doing. Yeah. Um, shoulders, hands can, can also tell a great deal. I mean, you could look at any position of a sprinter's posture, mm -hmm. an athlete's mm -hmm. posture when they're sprinting. And usually you can, once you see it enough, and again, the video analysis, once you do that enough, you could pretty much close everything off and guess what the shoulder's doing, yeah, what the opposite yeah, yeah. foot's doing, what the opposite hip's doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, just based off seeing how, how their body's moving through it. Yeah, that, I mean, that's interesting too, the, the hand positioning. Like, you would never really think that, like open palm, closed palm. You know, and then you said that you had them hold things in their hands. Yeah, yeah. So we have like these um, kind of like weighted. I don't. I don't want to. Uh, Fucking egg weights. You got egg weights. <laughs> egg weights. Give me a sponsor. Is that who I'm supposed to shout out? To? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But but more or less, yes. Yeah. So I've I've homemade my own version of. Did those. you really? Yeah. Damn, that's um, crazy. Man, get this man some egg weights, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've homemade my own version of those, and it's the same concept. So gotcha. um, the big thing um, in in using those is again, it's funny. Like if you put the wrist in a certain position, again the opposite, and it's not it's not crazy exaggerated. I'm not okay. saying that you're going to do this and they're going to automatically move the right way. But yeah. when you experiment with when you experiment in in intelligent manner mm -hmm. and really the main part that I think is the the most important part and take biggest takeaway from that is I'm the experimenter the kid is probably looking at me like why the heck do you want me to hold it between these two fingers and oh, my hand like this and they might look at me like I'm crazy but all of a sudden they sprint and they're not thinking about everything else you know so okay. sometimes it's just the intentional it's taking the intention away from it yeah. um, and the thought away from it that that's really again, interesting when you overcoach kids it's it's just too dynamic of a movement and too fast of a movement it's yeah. running can't get any faster it's just about in human locomotion um, mm -hmm. so when you're over coaching and over yeah. you know wordy with with how you coach kids mm -hmm. and sprinting it can it can do some I don't want to say do some harm but certainly, yeah. certainly from a technical standpoint so gotcha. we want to take the thinking away from the kids so mm -hmm. if I'm giving them something it's I tell them think less. So if there's yeah. you see on your shoulders, you're not thinking where I previously would say. I know there's too there's too much to go around. Uh, previously, I would say don't, out. I don't want to see the PVC rotate again. That wasn't the smart thing to do. Now gotcha. I tell them move fluidly. I actually want to see the PVC rotate. That's gotcha. That I'm looking for. So, mm -hmm. um, but generally for for the athletes um, in in especially upright postures max velocity type of, of sprint setting. Um, mm -hmm. So they're upright, they're sprinting at their, their top speeds. Yeah. Generally, there is an overemphasis on horizontal forces. So mm -hmm. um, through acceleration, um, and I think, again, I can't really, th this isn't really something you might tell a coach a kid on a switch or remove and replace an acceleration from a foot strike standpoint. Okay. Um, but when we overcoach, stay low or I jump know, out yeah. or project at this certain angle, yeah. um, they start thinking too much. Um, and they, you know, generally speaking, at, at upright speeds, it's 
it's a misunderstanding of the vertical forces that are necessary yeah. to maintain and really um, hold a faster top speed. Gotcha. Um, because we are overly front to back. From yeah. The, the swing of the arms to also the what's happening at the hips. Yeah. So I was, I, I think I seen a post you put up where it was a sport athlete and then a track athlete and the overstride that they had from the sport athlete to the track athlete. Yeah, it wasn't me, but um, okay, it was okay. definitely. Uh, Man, every time I see something track oriented, yeah. I think it's you. Yeah. So. Funny. I think it was probably Dr. Ken, Ken Clark, um, okay. who is who is awesome um, at what he does. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably the post that you're alluding to. Yeah. Um, and again, so now, just that's a perfect example. So mm -hmm. I don't remember what those speeds were, but mm -hmm. I'd imagine that even that field sport athlete was still moving really fast and probably oh, yeah, for fast sure. enough to be extremely successful in their sport. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's now, again, it's okay, so in that in that kid that was the one that I explained was five six, 185, 190 pounds, our running back, mm. one of our better running backs we've ever had. Um, when when he would sprint and accelerate, you would you would feel the ground shake because of how much power and force <laughs> he was into applying ground. into the ground. It was yeah. incredible. Um, just watching guys like that and watching that's like my yeah. favorite people to watch to sprint, especially accelerate. It's like yeah. big running back types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just They're producing the force. Such right? incredible forces into the ground, mm -hmm. and that's. To be real with you, yeah, you, you might get in the open field, but yeah, I mean those football. that acceleration ability um, is what makes them so great. So for many of those types, they probably have that over exaggeration and um, mm -hmm. over commitment to those horizontal forces because that's what makes them so great in acceleration. Mm -hmm. And top speeds are super important especially in a training methodology that's why we use them mm -hmm. um, because of the forces that can be applied and the forces that I just think there's no way to mimic upright mm -hmm. sprinting at top speeds mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day acceleration and, yeah. and the ability to accelerate is what makes those field sport athletes um, so great that's know? what I was thinking I, you know obviously you put more of an importance on acceleration yeah. As opposed to top end speed and, for the sport know, athlete. So, so here's where um, I have changed my thought process on that too, mm -hmm. because um, incredible mentors of mine. One in particular, Eddie Grayer, was mm -hmm. my mentor at, at Rutgers, and, gotcha. and still a person that I look up to today. Um, and his general commitment to all field sport athletes was going to be based on acceleration, mm -hmm. primarily acceleration. Mm -hmm. and change I, direction? or Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so to me, too, and I know we never really got into the summer programming, but yeah. my, my change of direction, I'm going to include in the same um, uh, ideas as acceleration. Because change in direction is decelerating and accelerating at a different angle. So, sure. So yep. to me, that's important to train um, acceleration on those days. Gotcha. Um, so 100%, yes, acceleration, change mm -hmm. of direction, but not much in the top speeds is what I mean okay. um, and my my change of that was number one um, that field sport athlete the way that they were moving mm -hmm. I would say there's there's potential for hamstring pull there yeah. and flexor pull there and sprinters pull because they're so incredibly fast and, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. tendon can't take the forces everything it happens sometimes but gotcha. if we can kind of improve or improve the athletes um, specific technical model, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. then hopefully we are going to set them up in a position that it's less likely that they have some of those soft tissue injuries. So, mm -hmm. um, and even if, what some would say is, okay, a power running back, mm -hmm. how many times are they going to break into the open field? Number one, if, if they have one, I hope they've had a dosage and, yeah. you know, uh, for lack of a better term, term almost a vaccine of, of, mm -hmm. of that what they're expected to do on the field, which yeah. is an all outburst at upright speeds. Number one, are they gonna get hawked down? Number For sure. Are they gonna pull a hamstring in the open field? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ideally not, but also uh, football coaches in general, and mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's it's a bad thing whatsoever, the practices are usually, think of any drill you ever did, you finish with a burst. And yeah. if you don't give a long enough burst, they get on you. Yeah. So you also have to prepare them for what's to expect. Probably. Honestly, you gotta prepare them, and I learned that, I, I would say I learned this, especially from Joey at FAU, was like, it's more important to prepare them really like let's prepare them for practice because yeah. that's where that's doing the most of the work there. of the training stress is going to come from yep. um and anyway so i don't know how i got off on this but oh so my change in thought was 
yes, from a from a technical model standpoint, we can hopefully help them set them up for um, a little more resilience against injury. Yeah. Um, number one, it's a dosage of top speeds gotcha. and those postures that hopefully they'll be prepared for it. Mm -hmm. But also, to me, um, and it's actually something that I'm I'm starting to toy with. I think I'm going to do it right after after we're done here. Is um, looking at especially like ground contacts, and so the the amount of force placed into the ground at the time and how abrupt it is just cannot be mimicked in any other way. Okay. So from a training standpoint to me, if there's something that we can we can like milk the absolute most out of from a, 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 a and it's extremely taxing. So yeah. I'd say it's the most taxing CNS max effort. Yeah. Um, that you can do, especially at upright speeds that the ground contacts are just so abrupt. Mm. Um, but if I can get if I can get that training stimulus out of that, I'm going to use it. And yeah. also, if we're going to use it, our athletes better be moving well when they're going through whatever that method is. So True. it's just like a, I want a kid to have a, you know, mm -hmm. adequate and appropriate squat pattern. Yep. Um, we want them to have a model that is applicable yeah. to what we want them to do on the track or on the field from upright speeds. That's excellent, man. So guys, hope you guys take a note of this. I am at least. You know, uh, but I do, I'm going to be selfish a little bit because, you know, primarily I work with combat sport athletes. Yeah, of course. I'm going to put you in a role. Let's say you're okay. me. All right. Okay. My guys can't sprint for shit. Sure. Their goal really is to not run. They don't want to run around the ring or the cage at all. But the training stimulus that they will get from running, I do see a significant increase in power production, force, you know, force into the ground. And if you can produce force into the ground, you'll have greater an ability to strike harder and faster. If you were me, what would be, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know, this is. <laughs> but take your time. Sure. What would you do with an MMA fighter when it came down to putting together, like as I say, for instance, I have Dustin Poirier, mm -hmm. right? And I come to you and I say, John, I want to put together a running program for, for Dustin, right? I want to get him faster. I want to get his turnover rate faster so he can produce more power. What would we do? Um, and thanks for putting me on the spot. No and doubt. Give me because no I doubt. don't, I, I'm not entirely familiar yeah, with yeah, like yeah. scheduling. Sure, yeah, like yeah. That. Number one for me, because it is, it is not the most, it, it certainly is not, just like you said, they want to avoid running, but uh -huh. if, it's, if it's far from being a specific movement and task that's necessary to the fighter's success yeah, in the fight yeah. coming up, mm -hmm. and also understanding those forces, understanding the um, joint positions, understanding the postures, again, soft, soft tissue injuries mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. So, we want to limit those, especially close as close to being prepared to fight as sure. possible. So, sure. in an ideal setting, again, I'm sorry, I don't know the, the, okay. the you know necessarily a fight schedule. But, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, the further out from the fight, I feel like within, and this is this is just making it more complicated because then I have to think of what we're doing in the weight room and, sure. and what have yeah. you. But yeah. if it lines up with with what we're doing in the weight room, I would say just very and everything is. Sprinting wise should be low volume, no matter what. Okay. So it should, to me, it should always be if, if you're truly training sprint ability and you truly want the most out of that, what you're getting from a CNS standpoint, mm -hmm. it's just like, just think of anything else that we're doing in mm -hmm. the weight room, anything else we're doing from a plyometric gotcha. um, methodology. If you've, you know, you, you, you can't like, you, you're just you're just trying to microwave it if you're if you're saying that yeah. we're going to do ten max effort sprints. Mm -hmm, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because especially well, be, for fighters, because yeah. fighters I'd imagine would sprint and then they'd be back and they'd be like, all right, can I? Sprint oh, one hundred percent. It'd be first, back and forth, right? Forever. It's it's, yeah. it's very tough, and and mm -hmm. you know generally it depends on who the athlete is, but. Mm -hmm. High level sprinters oh, may or may not be like that. I'm sometimes. bringing I'm bringing Dustin over to you, by the way. This <laughs> Some, is happening. Sometimes they'll sprint. Happen. Sometimes they'll sprint and be patient and say, "Okay, yeah. I can wait five minutes till my next." Bro, sprint. I don't think you'll ever get that. Right. No, so, you'll never so that's, get that. That would be tough. But then, with that said, so then also with time constraints. Okay, so it's two or three yeah. high le high effort sprints yeah. um, all out, and and again, you know, because um, that can take the place of any type of of max effort lift i believe i would i would argue yes yeah. you know um 
from a from a training stimulus perspective right it depends on who and yeah. where and when mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um, I'll be the first proponent for sprinting yeah um, it's the ultimate plyometric to yeah me. Um, I feel like it takes I, t I feel like it takes you know, it, it takes the place of so many different aspects of training. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you're gonna get a plyometric out of it. Yeah, you're gonna get force production out of it. And if I have, I need to get the biggest bang for my buck, I need to maximize my time, well then yes, we can do some some sprinting. Now, are we gonna, do, we gotta make sure that he has proper biomechanics. Correct. That would, where you would be coming in, where I'd be like, John, take a look at him, because you know what I mean? At the end of the day, I know how to throw a punch, I know how to throw a kick, sure. but running in a linear fashion, sure. you are an expert in that, so I will, outsource that accordingly because that's how I know my strengths and weaknesses. With that being said, do we strap them up to a sled maybe to... So, acceleration mm -hmm. potentially. Gotcha. Um, and now, then I don't want to get into too much detail of like sprint modeling and race yeah. modeling, but you know, if you're going, if you're looking for like early acceleration for a 100 meter sprinter or 200 mm -hmm. meter sprinter or whatever really event or whatever mm -hmm. race or whatever it may be, you're talking dry phase, yeah. um, you know, load it up pretty heavy and there's some research out there that suggests the benefits of heavy loaded um, towing and resisted sprinting. Mm -hmm. um, that would be where you see the greatest benefit. Um, but that's also maybe where the you could get some benefit out of what you're doing in the weight room too. Sure. You know, where yeah. really that, that top, so then you have like the next kind of transition type phase if you wanted yeah. to speak track language, but kind sure. of, you know, talking in that next, then a lighter sled, lighter towing might be beneficial. When you're looking at, you know, max velocity sprinting and, mm -hmm. and top speeds and, and at, at an upright posture, um, that to me is where it's, that is the toughest thing to mimic in the weight room, I'm sure. if not impossible. I'm sure. You know, so that's where it's really um, a challenge. Is okay. So if we're looking for that, just like I said, just brief, crazy, abrupt um, ground contact mm -hmm. um, on the ground, and crazy amounts of forces that probably no jump could even mimic. mimic and, yeah. You know, from a plyometric standpoint, um, it that that's just impossible to mimic under yeah. the bar. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, in, in in some ways, towing is you know would certainly be be beneficial. Like I said, yeah. especially in acceleration. But. Well, well, here's the thing I'm thinking about now. You know, I got a lot of fighters and a lot of coaches that train fighters that listen to the podcast, and I know that one, they do want to utilize these techniques for these types of athletes. And two, they may not have a, a fucking gym right now to even train them at. So yeah, you can sprint. You can take a sled, you can take a tire, wrap that up, Absolutely. and still get a training effect without having the weight room and still get your fighter ready for a fight, or if you are a fighter. So that was one thing that I was thinking, um, but I mean, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I don't wanna keep you too long, but I do have two questions that I always ask my guests, and I want you, you can take your time with it, but well, one is gonna be, I always like to find out, because I have my own routine, I have my morning routine, routine. people know it now, but, um, what's your morning routine? What do you usually do? What does John do when he wakes up? Is there any type of steps that you use or, or any type of routines or rituals that, uh, that get your day going? Yeah, usually um, I would say um, at home, not necessarily anything crazy aside yeah. from, you know, getting wake ready up, to go brush out my teeth. Door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that, I think there's, there's beauty in that routine, of course, yeah. as well. For and sure. Just, you know, um, I think that's an added benefit of just the general things that we wake up mm -hmm. um, doing. But um, certainly when we get on the campus, uh, when I get on the campus, I, yeah. I like to do um, some form of reading before nice. my groups, and I like to, I like to get started early so that another kind of um, tranquil moment is mm -hmm. some peace and quiet before setting up the room for uh, my group. So, you know, that's the main thing is like when I get on the campus, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge music guy, mm -hmm. which, you know, being on a podcast, it's, yeah. it's hard to say that then I would almost, I almost prefer to listen to music on my drive to work <laughs> in the morning. Um, yeah. And that's, that's probably my biggest challenge from a standpoint. Well, here's it, it, it was John, like music in itself is a huge dopamine uh, response that you can get from that, well, depending on what music you're listening to. Yeah. Um, and I could see that kind of setting you up. This could be a level of tranquility that, yeah. that gets your day going because now you're you're putting yourself in the right mindset. Yeah. yeah. So that, that makes sense. Yeah, but, and then, you know, still, um, there'll be days when it's like, I gotta 
turn a podcast on. Yeah, you know, get some self learning exactly, in. Exactly. Feel good about and then, it. But unfortunately, usually that takes over for the reading. Maybe you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, listen. Whatever form of correct. of information you want to get, yeah. that's all I say. Podcast, audio book, whatever you want. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. As long as you're getting it in. Absolutely. You know. Okay. So then the second one is going. To, now this one's going to be a tough one. Okay. This is always a tough one. People right. are like, damn, it's a good question, but. So the the name of the podcast is the Rue Strong Podcast. What does a strong person mean to you? What's like the definition of a strong person? Um, that is a great question. Um, I always like a word that always resonated with me, and I know it, it it's simple to say, and it's it's almost a little cliche, but integrity was always a word that really resonated for me when mm-hmm. I was younger. Um, Seeing the routine of my dad being a really hardworking man mm-hmm. every every day and yeah. being able to see like he had no on and off switch and still doesn't um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know he's got no on and off switch um, he's always like who he what who he is is who he is and that's who he'll always be and you know I would say the same for my mom and just yeah. you know, most of my family members just because that's, cool. that's kind of the cloth we're we're cut from. Mm-hmm. Um, but that always meant a lot because to me, integrity always meant about like who you were behind closed doors. Sure. So I think a big thing, especially in our society today, is identifying the things that are most meaningful to us mm-hmm. and standing up for them, no matter what they are, no matter when they are, no matter where it is, no yeah. matter how we stand up for it. Um, in the face of adversity, in the face of people that maybe don't agree with it, whatever, really whatever it is from a training standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, from a personal standpoint, I think yeah. there's, I think there's a lot out there that, um, you know, especially in coaching kids, mm-hmm. so just, just find what is absolutely meaningful to you and matters more to you than anything. It's not going to be Instagram. It's not going to be TikTok. Yeah. There's going to be something much more meaningful to you. Mm-hmm. Find that cherish that identify that and and protect it with everything you've got and to me that is where i would say is where the strength comes from it's not it's not flimsy and okay mm-hmm. well this goes wrong so you know and it also is how you know that also presents itself in just general daily demeanor yeah. you know it's like just like i said pops had no like on and off switch like are we you know you have a bad day is it now just wearing on your face you know i know yeah, yeah yeah and, and yeah like it's it's important to have those people that we can you know talk to and bounce ideas off to you yeah. know um share emotional stuff but at the same time there also is a necessity for 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 daily strength and and you know um just i, I guess grit to be um you know who we are and un- unapologetically sure um that i think that's a, a, i guess that's cool. a few ways that i would define it nice man that's actually a really good answer to be honest with you i think it was yeah. one of the best we got yeah. so, nice. good stuff hear that. <laughs> yeah. all right man so go ahead plug your stuff make sure people are following you if you guys aren't i highly recommend it cool. so go ahead john cool. appreciate it um i get the best place i would say is on instagram it's coach underscore garris g-a-r-r-i-s-h um, that's where I share the most. That's also probably where I'm, I'm the easiest to connect with um, until we get close enough, hopefully, to share cell phones or something like that, and then mm-hmm. that's a good way to connect. But um, that's really the best way. Uh, I'm John under, at John underscore Garris, J-O-H-N underscore uh, G-A-R-I-S-H on Twitter. Um, and, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm mostly on Instagram, so I'll share most of our content through there. That doesn't mean yeah. I won't share it through Twitter, but usually it's just kind of uh, looking for information on Twitter and, and sharing the most through Instagram. Yep. And be on the lookout. Me and John are probably going to do a YouTube video pretty soon, too, as well. Go over some speed mechanics. And uh, again, John, thanks for coming Appreciate on the show. It. And what are we at? Episode something. Who knows? 21? No, we're, we're getting there. We're getting yeah, there. We're getting there. We just roll them out oh, yeah. no matter That's what. It. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you again next time. Appreciate it.